Hello and welcome to Crossroads 307, the show where all things Wyoming come together. From agriculture and energy to environment and technology, we talk about it all here at the Crossroads. I'm your host, Seth Frenthaway, and earlier this week I was able to sit down and have a visit with a Wyoming native from Casper, who's had a fair share of experience with a variety of Wyoming's most pressing issues. John Robitaille is Encore Green Environmental's president of Wyoming, and he's been working to tackle some of the state's water problems. Here's how it went. Watch. Well, welcome to the show, John. Appreciate you being here. This is John Robitaille. Um, it's got quite a few years of petroleum association experience. What, like 18? Is that right? Mm-hmm. That's 18 right. years there, and it's got a rangeland management degree. And today we're talking about um, water. And John's kind of in a unique position to be able to talk about it from both angles, from kind of an agriculture side as well as from the energy side. And being in Laramie County, John, we don't. I think you were mentioning earlier, I was just kind of pointing out that we don't really deal with irrigation down here. Uh, like at least in the same way you do in the northern part of the state, so we face some some different issues. Most of it's groundwater issues, and if you could, could you take just a second and kind of help outline uh, for us um, a little bit of the, the the problems that the energy industry faces regarding water, and then how that either impacts or could benefit um, what we're seeing in agriculture. Sure. So so industry uses water in two ways. Uh, the first way is, is in any kind of fracking operation or um, uh, sometimes uh, called completions. Mm. Uh, typically, they use uh, a tremendous amount of water in those, in those types of, of operations. And, and really what it is, is it's mostly, mostly water, the, the, the whole... Um, looking for The formula? The formula, mm-hmm. the formula is is typically ninety nine percent water, okay, and then uh, a little bit of sand, and then some other things, uh, chemicals that you would typically find under your kitchen sink, okay. So, uh, so that is injected into the well under a, a very high pressure. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's usually uh, in a gel state when it goes downhole, mm-hmm. and and what it does is it goes into the the, the formation actually cracks. Okay. And then the gel with the uh, almost like a jello type of thing, if you can imagine that. Yeah. With a piece of sand in it goes into that crack, and then the jello melts essentially, oh, I see. and then it's pumped back out. So. Um, so it's the kind of, sand kind of be flowing through to, to to wash it out as it right okay. right so that's called flowback and okay. that's flowback water is is typically what people say when they say I that see. yeah and uh, and that's got uh, you know that's got all kinds of, of chemicals and, and and various things in it sometimes the sand will come back out but but that sand stays stuck in the in the crack mm-hmm. that's made through the pressure leaving that crack open to allow the gas or the oil to, to uh, come down into the well bore. That's, that's what it's for. So, I see. So when we have flowback water, mm-hmm. that's typically put in uh, reinjection wells, or um, sometimes they, they can repurpose it and use it again in another frack operation. But, okay. But uh, when we say a frack, with, you know, there's, there's various stages of fracks. Uh, in these new lateral wells uh, that are two miles plus long, mm-hmm. you could have 80, 90, 100 different stages, mm-hmm. which each time you're putting all of this back down hole again. Uh-huh. So, so you're pulling that water back up and rerunning it through and so on and so forth. And then when you're finished, uh, that water is then disposed of. I see. A- another process that, that water comes into play, uh, well, actually two more. Uh, there's there's another one where um, when you're producing wells, a lot of these formations have water in the formation already. So, so that's coming out with the gas or oil that you're you're trying to to um, receive, mm. and and then you have to do something with that water on a regular to, basis. On a regular basis, yeah. yeah. Uh, I've heard estimates as high as uh, three barrels of water to one barrel of oil. Yeah, I think there was like. One, I think the numbers I saw, at least for 2018, 2019, I don't think has all of it out there yet, but probably, actually, I think it was on high uh, track uh, to in, exceed what the 2018 water numbers were. But in 2018, I think the number was somewhere around 1.8 billion barrels right. of water. And there's, what, 42 gallons 42 in each gallons barrel. 42 gallons in a barrel. So we're mm-hmm. talking about billions of, of water. Gallons. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So when you were talking about the flowback and you originally, you know, you're, bu- you're drilling the well. Right. 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 Um if you if you do you have any idea of what the ratio is to the amount of water that we're using to drill 
those wells versus the amount of water that we're actually producing over the life of the well. I mean, I heard, I've, I've heard uh, di several different numbers. Like, um, I think it was one of like either Source Water or B3, which is a, it's another water uh, traceability company. And they were talking about that, oh, like really only about 10% of the water that we actually produce from these wells is actually going back to fracking. Mm -hmm. So most of that water is wasted. Well, yes, uh, it's it's either put in a pit, okay, uh, an evaporation pit, which are which are extremely large, mm. and uh, <clears throat> they're they're the water is held on lease, and then a truck comes up and sucks it out of a tank, okay, and then takes it and puts it in a pit, uh -huh. or it's put into an injection well. Now the injection well, you you actually drill into an aquifer, okay, and that aquifer has to be the quality of that water has to be at least as bad or worse than the water you're putting into that aquifer. Okay. So it's got to be pretty bad stuff to begin with. Yeah. And and so what, what you're doing is you're taking a, a potentially usable water and putting it into a, a very unusable aquifer, mm. very deep in the ground, uh, you know, miles into the ground, yeah. where uh, essentially nobody is going to want to lift that water back out yeah. and use it. And even if they could, if they could afford to lift it out, then they're going to have to go through a tremendous amount of treatment even to get it to a point where it's usable. At that point, it's almost lost. It, it is. It's yeah. basically lost. Yeah. Uh, one other source of water, the, another way that water can be used is in uh, a secondary recovery type of operation where okay. uh, you're, you've drilled a, a bunch of wells. You've got an old, uh, older field. Uh, it's been around for a long time. It's starting to peter out a little bit in terms of its oil. Mm -hmm. You can run superheated water through the formation, mm. and it, it somewhat scrubs the oil off of the formation, and then you come it up and separate it and produce it again. I see. Uh, but, uh, but that typically then, once that water is finished, typically, again, that water would then just be put back underground and, and never seen again. I see. So, I mean, the, the, kind of the bottom line here, that uh, one of the things that's standing out to me is that if you want to, if you if you're going to continue to produce in, in oil and gas, you got to have water. Not only do you need water to, to continue development, but water is always going to be an issue of okay, what do we do with it, right. and where should it go? Which kind of leads me. I mean, I, like I said, I'm from Laramie County, and in Laramie County, I mean, I've done different real estate deals and things like that, and we're in different developments, and working over in the planning office too. It's always a topic, you know, what's the aquifer doing? Whether it's you're talking about a residential setting or even in or even in, in development, and in Laramie County, we're selling an awful lot of uh, aquifer water. So can, can you touch on a little bit about uh, how that kind of relationship works between um, seeking that type of a water source for production uh, versus maybe reusing some of the water that's coming out of the ground? How, how does that all play? Sure. So, <clears throat> so Laramie County is unique in Wyoming in that... Uh, there is there is little to no surface water in Laramie County, mm -hmm. and and so uh, everyone has always relied on the aquifer that, that underlays the county, and it's a it's a big aquifer. I mean, it, there's a lot of water in it. Ogallala goes like seven states or something yeah, down the Tennessee the, Valley, I think. Yeah, the it's Ogallala big. is huge. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a tremendous amount of water in it. However, uh, what's happened with the new development in this county? Uh, the, the companies have now gone out and, and essentially repurposed the water that was used for irrigation. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a rancher and I'm irrigating a hay field, I can sell that water to the oil company <clears throat> to use in their, in their process, mm -hmm. uh, their drilling and completion and everything process. Uh, and, and then I don't get to use that water for the intended purpose. Mm -hmm. So I can no longer use that water for irrigation if I decide to sell it. Okay. That's a that's a state engineer permit that they have to go through it's to get either that or. done. Either or. Okay. You either, you either use it to irrigate or you sell it. But you can't do both. You can't do both. I see. So so I think uh, one of the one of the benefits that I see with uh, with our, our Encore Green process. Okay. We can take the water that's being produced from those wells mm -hmm. and we can do two things with it. We can sell it back to the company and they can use that to, uh, to complete their wells with. And we can take that water and clean it up and put it on the surface for the rancher 
who then doesn't have to worry about putting another straw into the Ogallala, mm. thereby not drying down the Ogallala any further, and he gets to keep his water that he is irrigating with. Which, speaking of Encore Green, Encore Green is our sponsor for this pro for this program. So we'll cut real quick and go to uh, a word from our sponsor. Encore Green Environmental uses their patent-pending conservation by design method to repurpose byproduct water for conservation, ag, and improved air quality. Visit EncoreGreenEnvironmental.com. So, John, you were just talking about uh, being that you know Encore Green, uh, the company that you're working with now. You're the president of Wyoming for Encore Green. And so you're kind of handling everything uh, Wyoming-wise uh, for our audience. I, I'll, I'll inform you on that. And you were just mentioning about how Encore Green could could potentially take waters that were being produced and 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 provide an, another avenue so that particularly in Laramie County, but really all the state, but really where where aquifers are hit hard, we could stop doing that and 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 kind of solve some of that problem. Correct. We could we could stop. We could stop pulling water out of freshwater sources. Mm -hmm. uh, we can, we can. And we don't uh, need fresh water to, to, to drill with or produce. No, with, right. No, so we certainly don't really not. need it anyway. We don't need yeah. that. But but when you're limited, that's what you have to sure. do. So sure. so yeah. that's what they've been doing. Um, we can we can repurpose that water and put it back on the surface for the landowners. Uh, we can we can put it in ponds uh -huh. for uh, for livestock to drink. Uh, the, really, the, the, the process is unlimited as to what we could do mm -hmm. in terms of benefits to everyone involved. Okay. Tell me a little bit about this, because if, if, I'm, if I'm a guy who's in Laramie County who is worried about the water, part of the reason I'm worried about it is because, you know, I want the environment to be uh, uh, in good shape, and water's really important for it, so making the best use of it's really important to me at the same time. I want to make sure that that things will be done done right, you know. So, what are the? Can you step us through some of the? the I'm a, I'm a guessing it must have been a nightmare getting permitting for this. So, can you tell me? Give me a couple. You know, where's that at? Or is is there any oversight going on for for uh, Encore or anything? Or, or where are we at on that? So, every project we have, we have a permit through the Wyoming DEQ, the Department of Environmental Quality. Now, the, the DEQ really sets limits on all kinds of constituents. Uh, it could be uh, uh, anything from, uh, from chloride to iron or... Mm. Uh, I mean, there, there's a whole litany of things that, that we have to... And it's a level that mm -hmm. you have to meet. It's, uh, you know, it's usually a, a, a milligram per liter level that must be met. So uh, any time that we would we would go into these these projects, we'll we'll go and get a permit from DEQ, and uh, and then we have to meet these constituents. Now, in that permit, there's going to be things like uh, SAR, the soil absorption ratio. Okay. Uh, EC, electrical conductivity. Those are those are measures of of salts build up within the soil. Okay. Now, Wyoming soils in particular. In many places, Wyoming soils are very salty. Mm -hmm. uh, anytime you see a, a rock formation, an outcrop that's red, uh, it was because that was once underwater, yeah. and the iron in it oxidized. It basically rusted. So, so in Wyoming, we're we're blessed with a lot of coal mm -hmm. uh, up in the Powder River Basin. I and heard that was uh, yeah. that was of course uh, due to a a, a sea a saltwater swamp. Okay. Millions of years ago, so you can imagine how salty that soil yeah. is. So, um, so one of the things that we would do, we would monitor those soils to ensure that we don't uh, do any kind of damage in terms of additional salt loading on those soils. In addition to meeting meeting what we need to meet in our permits. And if I remember it, sorry, I mean to interrupt you, but when you're talking about that, it, it, that was the um, not to always go back to the bad stuff, but. But the cobalt methane days, when we when we were using some of this water and putting it out on the ground, then too, you know, I've I've often heard that there was all these bad things that happened to the soil, and there was some not so good things that happened to the soil, but it wasn't all bad either. But what is it that you think made the difference between between whether whether there was something that happened that was good or whether we ended up destroying something? Was what was that determining factor? I, I really think what we did in uh, in in the coal bed days, our, one of our mistakes we made was putting too much water on too little surface. Mm. 
uh, and and I, I think our company now, uh, what we're what we're doing now is is a lot more beneficial. We're putting less water on more surface. I see. And and in doing less so, risky. much less risky. I see. Uh, in doing so, we're we're essentially creating a a um, almost a, a, a dampening rain. Okay. Instead of uh, instead of a, a flood situation, mm. we're we're essentially spreading out a, a light rain over a, a large area, I see. which uh, is much more beneficial to the soils. It's it's more what the soil is accustomed to. Uh, it's it's more what the grasses are accustomed to. Uh, it's just it's better all around the, the way that we're going to approach this. So. Tell me a little bit about. You said that it's better for the grasses. Can you tell me a little bit about, I've heard, you know, we've got some invasive species in the state of Wyoming, and it's kind of a big topic, and depending on where you are, again, in Laramie County, we don't really hear any about this stuff, you know, unless you're really paying attention. Of course, the rest of the state, it's it's a big deal. Right. Um, so, in the state of Wyoming, can, I mean, it almost seems like that you, if you put more water on that, that it just would grow more invasive species, but how, you know, I've heard that that, that can actually help. Can you tell me a little bit from your rangeland management type uh, I guess your your degree you got that spe- that expertise. How can that actually? How can we actually fight against that by just having more water? Well, I th- I think with uh, with a species like a cheatgrass. Okay. Uh, cheatgrass is an invasive species, meaning it it uh, it comes in and, and germinates very early in the season, mm-hmm. uh, grows very quickly, and then it dies and seeds again before these other grasses have an ability to to really come in and compete. Okay. So so in a, you know let's say we had a fire, a uh-huh. range fire. Uh, typically, the first thing you're going to see in there is a bunch of cheatgrass, and and that's why because it, it's so prolific and it's very difficult to get rid of because it does have a, a very short growing growing life really. Oh, I see. Uh, so so ultimately. What I think we can do with this water, uh, I think we can go in and, and chemically treat the cheatgrass early on uh, and kill it off and then use this water to the benefit of the native grasses so that they have an opportunity to grow and expand without competing with the cheat. Mm-hmm. And then we bring in some kind of a, a grazing operation uh, and, and any time we cut those grasses down, uh, what we end up doing is causing that grass. When you when you cut the top off a of grass, its its nature is to grow outward mm. and then back upward. So so essentially, we're creating more of a sod with these grasses, giving the ability to outcompete the cheatgrass. I see. Two things that come to mind about the cheatgrass. One, I mean, it, it kind of becomes pervasive either because of fire or because of drought. Uh, or is there other reasons? There, there's other reasons. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, overgrazing any, maybe too. Overgrazing okay. that would cause uh, an in- infestation. Um, really, any kind of, of massive disturbance. Okay. Would uh, would open the door for I cheat. See. I see. Okay. Um, so, what were we talking about before that? Though we were talking about how to get rid of it. Yeah, but how to get rid of cheek your ass, but also, um, before we started talking about invasive species, we were talking about what we can do with the water. Um, fires, we talked about. As far as as far as far fires go, um, can this water be used for anything? I mean, we're ta- we've are we been talking about it, and it sounds like we're going to be pretty scientific on how we put this water on the ground, how, how you know, we're going to pay attention to what the plant life's going on and things like that. Can the, can the water be used for anything else? I mean, I... You know, one of the things that I've heard a lot about in the legislative sessions, and then I'm sure we'll hear about it, we always hear about sage grouse, and a lot of trucks around in those areas where the sage grouse corridors are. So I'm thinking of things like, you know, can we can we take that water and cut down on dust? Can we use some of these other things, you know, uh, um, fire prevent, you know, for fires and stuff mm-hmm. like that? I mean, is that is that a use that this water can be used for? Or? You know, um Using it for dust suppression, um, that it's possible. Okay. We we can do that. Uh, we'd have to get permission from the Oil and Gas Commission to be able to do that. But, okay. But it is possible. I see. Um, there are better treatments for dust suppression than than water. Get water truck off the road. Water evaporates. I see. You know. Yeah. Um, but but speaking of trucks, 
what we will do is cut down on the dust to begin with. Well, how do you do that? Well, because uh, by by putting these these waters in tanks on location. Okay. In order to get rid of that, you you come in with a truck, a vacuum truck. Yeah. And and uh, you fill it up, and then you drive off, and then you dump it, and you go back, and you go back, and you go back. Back and forth all day. If we eliminate the need to fill those trucks with water mm-hmm. by using it more more uh, beneficially mm-hmm. for the surface, then we eliminate all those truck traffic and, and all that dust. Oh, because you use it right there. We use it there. You don't have to move it to anywhere else. We're not, just put it to use right there. We're not moving it anywhere. We're, we're using it right there on the spot. Mm-hmm. And we're using it to, uh, to, to not only uh, increase the the soil density, but also the plant life. Uh, we can we can put it in reservoirs for livestock drinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can put it in those same reservoirs, and uh, if uh, there's a fire nearby and a helicopter comes by, they can they can put their bucket in it and take that water and use it to fight fires. A couple things uh, on the ponds and the reservoirs. So a lot of questions right now in in a couple different areas up north about ponds and reservoirs and what kind of what kind of issues they're causing for the the environment. How does what we're, I mean, you, you were just saying we put it in ponds. They're different ponds, though, right? I mean, different, we're talking about different water, I guess. Is, different, yeah, everything would be different. It, it, it would not, our water would not go into a reservoir unless it goes through the cleaning process and it meets oh, so all the requirements. Oh, it's already clean. It has to be I clean, see. and then we can put it into a reservoir. Okay. And then that would eliminate some of these issues that people are thinking about or, or that are causing for air quality in, in um, right. say, like the anticline or something. The, yeah. In, in, the, in the Pinedale area, we've, we've been fighting ozone for a really long time now. I think it was 2007 or eight when we first noticed it. Okay. Uh, th- that is a, a combination of things. Weather certainly plays a factor in that. Uh, snow cover plays a factor in that. But... Um, what we have been anticipating, what the DEQ is anticipating, is that that there are some some constituents coming off of these ponds that are contributing to the creation of ozone. Ah, I see. Uh, now it's very difficult to measure that because these ponds are so large. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they they've been talking about it for for a number of years that this could be a, a contributing factor. Now, what we could do is, again, we eliminate that problem mm. because we will not, that water will not see air until it's clean. And then the waste stream, of course, would go down a, a, an injection well where I, I believe that it should be. But the water that, that would come through our system would be clean before it reaches the air. Therefore, if there are any of these constituents that are, that are, uh, leaching out of the of the waters helping contribute to the problem mm-hmm. we would eliminate that problem as well so it almost sounds like there's a little bit of a debate on on what effect these ponds are really having but in any case whether they are or aren't what whatever extent that is repurposing that water eliminates the question altogether and it, and it just does something good with the water and, and that's correct i see that's correct okay all right well um Oh, one other thing, then I'll let you go, because I know we got, what are you, a legislative session? You probably got a bunch of important people to meet. <laughs> um, one other thing, and, and and this goes to, I, I had an experience where there was a, a big question that was happening up, up north in the Menina Divide. And you've got, um, uh, what is it, Athon? I think it's mm-hmm. called Athon. Mm-hmm. There was a couple meetings at, like, Thermopolis and, and, and Riverton where they were talking about the issue. Uh, if you aren't familiar with what the issue is, um, there is a are there are gas companies gas wells okay so mm-hmm. so there's gas wells that are up there in in the Menina Divide area there is a, a a river and some tributaries that are near a um, some some wells and a a cleaning facility and they've been taking water uh, that has been produced and they're cleaning it up to a certain standard uh, that's met by DQ, so they've got some standards, and then they put that water, just put it into a river, just let it go down river, and, and, it, and the, the theory is is that when you take some of this water that's less contaminated, but you put it into much cleaner waters like a river, then the, the dilution um, eliminates any problem that you might have. 
Um, and so this particular company wanted to increase the amount of effluent or the amount of water that was going into that river. And so they needed to get a permit, caused a lot of controversy. Everybody downstream um, was having issues with that. How does, how does what you guys do, how can that help that, that issue of, you know, do we need to put water, this water into rivers anymore? If we don't put it into, what kind of, how does that benefit everybody? The, the, the concept of, of putting these produced waters in rivers is, is not new. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, yeah, they were doing it to like the 60s or something. Oh, yeah, this, this. That, field, that field's been going on since, yeah. since the 60s. Yeah. Um, there are there are fields in the in the Bighorn Basin that produce a lot of water. Okay. And it's very clean water, and that water has been going down draws for so long. Uh, some of those landowners in the tributaries have filed water rights on it. Ah. So uh, it's not it's not a new thing mm -hmm. by any means, uh, but but the, there is a lot more opposition to it ah. lately, uh, particularly with this one. Uh, there's a there's a, a reclama or a, a reservoir that's used for uh, uh, recreation. Uh, there's a, a blue blue ribbon trout section uh, just below the dam. Mm. Uh, there's town below the dam. They, that does that does that I think that feeds both Riverton and Thermopolis. Does it? It does. They're all downstream. They're all yeah. Yeah, well. Riverton is is more. Uh, east, okay, but they still take water out of the Wind River, which goes into the I see into Boysen Reservoir. Uh, so, so really, our our process, we can help that particular company uh, because they are producing water, mm -hmm. and they need to they need to get rid of it somehow in order to continue to produce. Sure, uh, in injection wells in that area uh, are they've been looked at before. Um, They've been uh, rejected by the Oil and Gas Commission because of uh, because of the receiving aquifer. Uh, so, so our process we could help them tremendously and help the landowners right nearby mm -hmm. uh, by allowing them to continue to produce their gas and expand their gas field, and help the help the ranchers nearby by uh, providing better grasses, better soils. Uh, and and much much better carrying capacity for their livestock and eliminate a lot of the concerns for everybody that was downstream everybody not, everybody downstream doesn't have a problem doesn't have that problem anymore yeah. well john i really appreciate you coming in and stopping by i know you got to go we have a ton of want to talk about i know that uh, just a few of the permits that have just come up we will have you back and you can give us some updates on how that's going i think this this next spring is going to be the the big deal for that right i yes okay yes and uh, yeah, so really appreciate you. You know, it's interesting because we just talked about energy. We talked about agriculture. We didn't talk too much about technology just yet, but we'll get back to that at some point because I know you guys got some cool stuff going on there too. Absolutely. But if we got you got agriculture, you got you got energy, you got technology. We're of course we're in business and we and we are caring about the environment here. So this really fits with Crossroads. So I really appreciate you being on. Absolutely. Thanks Glad so much. to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. That's all for now like what we're doing and you know you do just ring the bell here to subscribe to us on youtube follow us on facebook linkedin or wherever else you can find us leave your comments in the comment section and let us know what topics you want to hear about most i look forward to seeing you back here next time at the crossroads